Yeah, perhaps we can start the Gong Show. And we have nine speakers, and each speaker has like 10 minutes. The first speaker is Jiaqang Bao from City University of London. He will tell us about something about Mahler measure. So, yes, Jiaqang? Yeah, uh, let me start to show my screen. Yes, you should share your screen when, okay, your time is now. Okay, I think. Right, okay. Yeah, so let me make a start. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about some ongoing work with Young and Eddie uh, about model measures and, and the more generally ranking functions, um, which are objects originated uh, from number theory, but they have uh, various applications in physics. So let's first start with the definition. Given the Laurent polynomial CP, uh, the model measure is defined like this as an integral, and uh, it can be generalized to ranking function like this. Uh, so we just replace this e to the i theta with this e to the i theta multiplied by e to the power x, where x are just some real numbers. So here we'll focus on um, C2. So we'll denote the coordinates as and w, And equivalently, we can write the, the two integrals like this. So let, let's consider an example. So I'll just use my grid. So we have a lattice polygon, and uh, for each point, uh, for each lattice point, we can assign a monomial in the Laurent polynomial. So like this point is one zero. So we have z to the power one, w to the power zero, which is z, and uh, this is w, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so we have a polynomial like this. So here, uh, let's consider these four coefficients to be minus one, and the constant term to be some non-active number. And uh, we can write the model measure like this. And if, uh, so our strategy to, to compute this integral would just be expand this log integrand and then apply residue theorem. Since we have this Z and W in the denominator, so only uh, the constant term uh, will contribute. And in the end, we find the model measure looks like this. But in general, uh, we may not have such a compact form and we'll just do it perturbatively like this, order by order. However, ranking function is just much more complicated. So, so here is a picture uh, for, for our example when, when the constant term is five. So besides uh, these, this gray region, we also have uh, five linear facets. So four of them are unbounded and there is one bounded uh, linear facet here. But overall, the whole function itself is smooth and uh, convex. In, in particular, we can find, you know, at uh, here, it's minimized at this point, which is zero, zero. And this means uh, model measure is the minimum of the ranking function. And we can also, another technique is to project this whole thing down to the XY plane, because something like this, which is called the amoeba, because it looks like the amoeba in biology. And its points are just log z log w, where z and w are the solutions to p equal to zero. So physically, this is just uh, the limit shape of crystal melting. So imagine we have a crystal maybe like this, and uh, we start to remove atoms from this tip. So if we remove enough atoms, we'll get a shape like this. And uh, in the thermodynamic limit, we'll have a smooth bound, which is this. And this is exactly the amoeba. And in particular, uh, the amoeba part, the region of the amoeba is called the liquid phase. And the uh, molten crystal part are solid phases. So um, for the above example, this square, well, um, it's just like we have a crystal looks like a pyramid and start to remove atoms from the top and it will get something that looks like this. And uh, the amoeba is the liquid phase, and uh, there are four uh, unbounded complementary regions, which are the solid phases, and, and also we have a hole in the middle. Uh, this is the gas phase. So, so we can see like the, the minus ranking function looks like this, is the limit shape of this crystal melting model. And also if we increase this K, at first when K is four, we have no holes and then we increase 
k will have a hole open up and the, for larger k, the size of the hole also will become larger and larger. So yeah, but so physically, and uh, we've seen like this is give some crystal melting model and these crystal configurations uh, have shown to be in one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, perfect matchings on our brain tiling and also they count bound states in the mirror geometry. So, so for example, uh, so I'm just showing you the two toric faces of, of our example. And these are the two brain tilings. And the, these red lines just give uh, one example for, for the perfect matching in each toric face. And, and for counting uh, bound states, uh, in fact, in this paper, the authors have shown that the partition function can be expressed in terms of the ranking function here. So it's an integral like an exponential like this. Uh, so it can be then applied to topologic strings, black holes, Donaldson and Thomas theory, et cetera, et cetera. So in my last minute, I will just uh, discuss what we have uh, done so far. So in quiver theories, uh, with certain choices of coefficients in, in the Laurent polynomial, um, some mathematical results for isoradial dimers can be generalized to non-isoradial ones. And also, uh, maximization of the model measure uh, we found that it's equivalent to a maximization and uh, the model measure and also ranking function these two objects are invariant in the cyber duality uh, and also there is another duality called specular duality um, model measure and the ranking functions they have uh, some nice properties uh, under this duality uh, so in for specular duals or we can write the expansion like this and uh, at each, at each order, uh, these coefficients, uh, they have the same fi as a function of these, maybe here we'll say of our charges and uh, for, for the specular dual theories. And in fact, this reveals um, the F term relations in, in the theory. So yeah, I guess that's all I wanna say. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me, let me, yeah, let me stop showing my screen. Yeah, what a nice talk. We yeah, maybe are there any questions? Yes, we have uh, three minutes for the question. If you have any question from the audience, maybe I'll ask something general. Um, if you so, you use the amoeba projection to illustrate this gas phase. Does the algae projection have anything interesting in this context? Uh, well, the alga has some uh, something related to the uh, the the slopes of the the ranking function. It has, mm. I guess that's all we know about the alga and then this relation to ranking function. Yeah, mm. but so far we haven't found any uh, like deeper physical implications. Yeah. Very exciting anyway. Thanks. Thanks. Is there any other question? So is there a relation between ranking function and spot conformer indices? Uh, yes, we are working on that. Uh, we, we, we think that it's, the, the, the model mesh and the ranking functions should also um, be related to the 4D superconformal index in our theories. But we're still working on that, yeah. I see, thank you. Okay, good. Still, we have two minutes if anyone has question. If not, I can ask Jokon to explain, uh, okay, some physics of this limit shape, something related to the black holes, perhaps you can explain more about these things. You mean now? Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, so, so um, yeah, actually, so, so we've seen, I've seen like two different uh, versions of it and, uh, um, so one is actually related to the, so because we've seen that uh, uh, bound states partition function and which is also some topological string partition function. So so then, um, well, I guess it's related, we can use the OSV conjecture, which gives us like the square, the square of that partition function, we'll get the one for the for the black holes, the partition function for black holes. And uh, also, um, I believe some kind of Lagrange transform will give us the, the entropy of the black hole. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, that's the, yeah, the connection we know so far. Yeah, very good. 
So, and just a technical question: Are we recording the session? Oh. Mm. All right, all right. Thanks. Okay, let's thank Jokong again. Thank you. Okay, so we move on to the next speaker, Dong Wook Kim uh, from Kaios. Thanks for introducing me. Let me share my screen. Yes, please share your screen. So for the next, can you see my slide? Yes, we have Don Cook Kim, and he will talk about BPS quivers. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, before proceeding, let me thank organizers for giving me a nice opportunity to present my recent work in this nice conference. And today I'm going to talk about 5D BPS quivers and KK towers. And this talk is basically about the computing written indices of for, for certain classes of super quantum mechanics, in particular, which is described by Cuba quantum mechanics. So uh, this work is based on a collaboration with Zihao Duan and Pilchen Yi, both are in KIAS. And to make sure that we are on the same page, let me briefly introduce what BPS Cuba is. Actually, this business began from four dimensional physics. So there, people wanted to understand what kind of a given charge of states, whether this kind of state is uh, uh, stable or not in gauge theory. For instance, this PPS quiver appears as a uh, tool which describes effective supersymmetric quantum mechanics for VPS objects in 4D cyborg written type theories. For instance, with n equal two supersymmetry or four dimensional, uh, with SE2 gauge group, the PPS quiver is described by these two noted quiver. And each node represents each elementary objects in gauge theory. And the number of arrows between nodes is determined by Schrodinger product between this uh, between between the charge of the charge this node represents. And the utility of this quiver gauge theory or quiver quantum mechanics uh, appears because a stable bound state problem with given charge sector in 4D and equal to theory is identical or has one-to-one -one map to 1D and equal four quiver quantum mechanics with the, uh, and if the non-zero written is, I mean, if this quiver quantum mechanics show non-zero written index, it is known that the bound state in 4D is stable. Also, wall crossing behavior in 4D and equal two gauge theory, which means that a stability of given charge state depends on the Coulomb moduli parameter in the theory can be reflected by the jump of between indices under FI tuning of quiver quantum mechanics. Because of this feature, this 4D BPS quiver has been used to investigate the spectrum structure of gauge theory. But today I'm gonna to talk about its 5D unlimited version of this, but one immediate obstacle we can face in dealing with this 5D BPS quiver is that in 5D gauge theory, the charged states, I mean, charged objects is not just point, but one dimensional string like object exists. So to, to bypass that difficulty, we need to introduce additional S1 circle and we need to wrap S1, I mean, we need to wrap the 5D full gauge, 5D gauge theory on S1 and think of a situation where, where all the extended objects are wrapped on that S1 we introduced. And one nice thing of this construction is uh, in full M theory picture, I mean, we have to use M theory, 11 dimensional theory to construct 5D gauge theory. And then in M theory side, this S1 reduction corresponds to introduction of uh, two, I mean, type 2A circle, and it is identical to reduce M theory to type 2A theory. There we always have D0 brain and corresponding states which carry KK modes along the S1 we need, uh, along the S1 we introduced before. And because of that states, it is quite easy to draw BPS quiver of 5D gauge theory. And this was possible due to brain tiling business because D0 brain states is T-dual to D3 brain probing Calabial 3, 
we initiated with, or we used to engineer five decades theory. So because of T-duality, the brain tiling setup and D0 brain sector is identical. And thanks to, to the fact, we can easily draw BPS Cuba for D0 or club K cable. And because, uh, and from the tiling sector, we can learn this Cuba always involves fine tunes for potential and cooler moduli pops up in addition to Calabria 3. We need we need it to engineer the five decades theory. And on another obstacle this imposes us is because of this fine tunes for potential, we cannot apply localization method or well-known methods of computing within indices to compute the within index of this 5 dbps Cuba. For instance, naive JK residue formula resulted in vanishing index for this 5D E0 SCFT keeper. But uh, our, I mean, physically sensible answer is given by this. As you see, these two results are different. So this talk briefly address how can we bypass, how we can bypass this different, I mean, this, this, this difference and get correct result. So this is quick summary for, so we couldn't uh, resolve this uh, problem for general quiver, but for restricted classes of quivers, we can uh, suggest a few resolutions. For single KK modes, a careful counting of our L2 normalizable states, which correspond to L2 cohomology of Calabria 3, uh, gives, I mean, results in this sensible Witten index. So we end up with FI independent Witten index of Abelian quiver, which represents single KK mode in 5D theory. And the answer depends on, uh, sorry, answer is independent of FI parameter, but only depends on the rank of SCFT. And for higher KK modes, this uh, careful counting based on L2 cohomology fails because we have too many non compact directions in targets, as the target is, I mean, as the target is symmetric produ productive, as we raise the rank of quiver gauge theory. But still, we can. Uh, utilize some approximation on this Calabria 3 side. So we can end up with the geometric, I mean, the sen physically sensible states are almost factorizable into two parts. One corresponds to SUN gauge theory, and another is corresponds to Abelian version of this complicated quiver. So again, the answer becomes FI independent. So we have the same result as single KK modes here. And for the electric of flavor particle sectors, uh, which doesn't possess any magnetic or nor instanton charges. So we can, we can apply Mannschaft only sense wall crossing formula with quiver invariant hypothesis. So this formula tracks with an indices um, and in particular it's wall crossing dependent part. So we can get physically sensible answer by imposing this quiver invariant for single noded quiver or single noded sub quiver of given quiver. And I like to emphasize that this answer is FI dependent and this can reproduce some of the spectra which we can expect from our physical intuition. So for the remaining time, let me briefly uh, summarize how we could count, how we could count this L2 cohomology based on mathematical theorems. First, there is this pairing between L2 cohomology. So if we know this upper part of L2 cohomology, then we can automatically know this lower part of one, except H3. But thanks to mathematicians, there are well-known theorem for manifolds with conical metric. And thanks to this theorem, we can relate this L2 cohomology with the round cohomology. And there exists pairing between singular homology and round cohomology. So this upper part of L2 cohomology is counted by counting geometric cycles in Calabria 3. So the natural witnesses corresponding to Avelian quiver is given by minus two times dimension of, uh, sorry, the number of four cycles in Calabria 3. And by introducing grading depending on this rank of cohomology groups, we can uh, having, I mean, and we can end up with having this Laurent polynomial in y fluxity, and this y fluxity has meaning in 
and in 4D or 5D gauge theory because it captures a C2 spin and gauge theory side. So this means we end up with spin half uh, state, which Sorry, number is one minute left. Yeah, which number is dimension, uh, which number is equal to the number of four cycles in Columbia three side. And in the end, we can realize that this number is equal to the number of neutral KK modes or the, and this, the states which are counted by this method corresponds to the Cartan part of vector multiplets. So there is this exactly Cartan many states, uh, Cartan many spin doublets in the theory, and we can easily conclude that this corresponds to Cartan parts of vector multiplets. So for the other parts of spectra, actually I gave a six minute long talk in another conference. So I refer you to this QR codes to those interested in my recent research. Yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you very much. We are, so basically there is no time left for the question. Yes, okay, but perhaps we can have one short question from the audience. If not, let's thank again. Thank you. Thanks. And okay, we move on to the next speaker, Jejuan Khao from Southampton. So can you share your screen, please? Okay. Hello? Uh, hello, can you see this? Yes. Okay. And the next speaker is Jejuan Hao from Southampton and he will tell us about the spins in conformal field theory. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the spins in conformal field theory and use the conformal field theory as an, as an example. And uh, this is based on the talk with my supervisor. Mm, and that, that's the introduction of my, uh, that's the plan of the talk. First, I will introduce and what is the spin in conformal field theory? Uh, and I will introduce uh, this in two different, from two different point of view. One is from the Eclodian signature. Uh, then I will introduce there from the Lorenzian signature. We will find some interesting properties of the spin. And then I will introduce a little bit about the rotations of the, of the quantum field theory. That's a, that's a special technique when we deal with different signatures in field theory. Then I will in introduce some uh, problems, problems in our project. And that's about the conformal basis. We use conformal basis to expand our fields. And that's, that's the plan of, of this talk. Now let's go into the next page. The next page is about, I made a form to introduce um, the spin. Uh, the main is uh, we, we consider the conformal field theory and the space time dimension is D. And we, I list this uh, from, two, uh, from two lines. One is from the Eclodian picture, picnic, picture. The other is from the Lorenzi picture. Picnic, uh, picture. And it's a symmetry group in, in, in Eclodian picture is SO uh, D plus one comma one. And once we once we we consider the represent the unitary representations uh, called the principal series of the SO D plus one comma one, and we will get uh, we will get the parameter delta is the scale dimension, and the rep representation row is the representation of of SO D. Uh, so what uh, uh, and the parameter uh, the parameter delta and G. Sure. Since G is is the is yeah. the representation of the SOD, it should be an integer, and uh, 
the, 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 the dimension delta lies on the principal series. It's d over two plus i. R is a real number. And in Lorenzi peak nature, we, we, we have the symmetry group SOD, comma, two. And we have also the representations called P, delta G, and lambda. Uh, we can, uh, uh, this is a kind of dec uh, decomposition of the symmetry group. And delta is, comes from SO1, comma, one. And G, G is, comes from SO1, comma, one. And lambda, is SO D minus two. Now we should notice that, that the time dimension uh, in Lorenzi's signature is not compact now. Uh, so the spin here will be will not be will, be will not be an integer. It will be a continuous value. So that's the our parameter here. The scale dimension is also uh, a continuous number. And, G, and, and the spin here will be continuous and no longer integer. And the, and the lambda is now will become an integer. And in, in most paper, we, we will take lambda to be one. And for, for uh, and, and here is a remark of, of, our, of the spin. And for physical local operators, uh, the spin should, should always be an integer. And, in Lorenzi signature, uh, for for physical non non local operators, G the spin could be um, could be a real number, and uh, the, and some recent work tell us that, uh, like the Lorenzi inversion formula, G could also be a complex number, not only real. Now I will tell you something about the weak rotation. The weak rotation is just uh, a technique. Tell us that how can we go from the including signature to the Lorenzi signature? Here is uh, is our time plan, complex time plan. We, I use tau to label the including time, and then use use t to label the Lorenzi time. Uh, what, uh, in our course, we know that um, if we want to do the rotation, we should we should specify some particular counter, and uh, here I will illustrate. Two counter. One is one is the red line, and the other is the green one. I use the one and the two. That's we can use these two counter to rotate our time. And for the first time, for the first counter, we have a nice picture, a nice space time picture. That's our um, explanation of the weak rotation. First of all, we start from uh, the imaginary time tau, and uh, then we. Uh, Go along the go along the counter to get to to go uh, go into the real time picture. Uh, that that's, uh, we can understand this as a, a, uh, we prepare an initial uh, state phi and uh, evolve this uh, evolve this uh, state along the real time and that's the Hamiltonian and uh, that's the unit uh, unitary evolution operator. Now that's uh, that's the that's all the basic stuff I want to tell you. Um, and another thing I want to tell you is that the bilocal field, the, the definition of the bilocal field is, is just the, the sum of the product of the uh, uh, two local field, phi. Phi is a local field. And uh, the capital phi is our bilocal field. We can treat this as a definition of the bilocal field. Uh, the thing I want to do is, is that I want to expand expand this by local field. So once we have, I want to use the conformal, conformal basis. Uh, we, 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 the, the key point is that we use the conformal, uh, conformal three-point function as a basis to expand the by local field. And this is our first formula here. And we have two delta functions here. And we should sum over all the spin and we should integral over uh, all, all the scale scale dimensions, and we uh, integrate over the overlap the space time dimension, and we can get the delta function. And once we have we have got the delta functions, this in this will allow us to expand the the bilocal field in terms of the three point function. 
this three point function is a three point three point three point form conformal field three point function, and delta now is a is a uh, scale dimension and and delta g is a um, delta now is the lowest scale dimension and uh, delta and g are the uh, variables in our integral. So that's that's the, uh, that's all, uh, everything. Uh, that's uh, everything I want to tell you now. But um, I want to uh, uh, there's a remark that uh, th this complication relation is from the including harmonic analysis, and this result uh, heavily based and relies on the compactness of the group SOD. That's a uh, that's a result result in including picture, not in Lorenzi picture. The picture, but if we want to do the Lorenzi picture, we will meet the non compact um, group S O D comma one one comma uh, D D minus one comma one. This will not be true in Lorenzi signature. So our former problem is that we want to generalize this uh, formula into Lorenzi version. That's our first problem, and. We uh, 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 a very naive guess is that we can, since uh, since the spin in Lorentzian pic uh, picture is not is not an integer, but a uh, mm, but a continuous number, but a real number, we can we can we can guess that well there might be some formula that this is not a sum that might be an integral over d g. That's a naive guess, but oh. But we can see that this will not be true, uh, since since as of d comma uh, d minus one comma one is not a compact. We we have we cannot decompose our rep representations into this term. You have thirty seconds left. Okay. Uh, another problem is the behavior of the spin, and next we come back to the come back to our picture here. Uh, in our rotation. Um, and uh, an interesting question is that how can we get uh, a continuous spin in the linear picture? picture? Um, from the including time, we have a discrete value of G, but in, but in Lorenzi picture, we have continuous G. Another interesting question is how can we deal with it, with it in weak rotation? Since weak, weak rotation is a continuous procedure, but uh, the fix of the spin is not well understood. That's okay. That's my. Those are my two questions here. Okay. Uh, those questions are still unsolved in our project. Okay. Thank you very much for your talk. And perhaps we have uh, a little time for a short question. Yeah, I have one. Uh, so actually, uh, I was not quite sure uh, regarding the SOD minus two. I thought the Cartan charges should be higher dimensional. So the vector, you just start saying it belongs to Z. I would say that should be Z to the power D minus two or something, right? Because uh, means the global charges labeling the representations uh, here. Uh, you so mean, it's, you mean the spin yeah. or? Yes, yeah, so or means even lambda here. So it is a, it should be the, means labeling the SOD minus two, right? So it should be some sort of, Representation level for SOD minus two, so that yeah, should be yeah, say yeah. like, yeah. Yeah, it should be uh, an integer, but. Mm. No, I'm not talking about J. Sorry, I'm talking about lambda and also uh, because. Uh, lambda. Yeah. So, uh, is a spin enough? Because. Yeah, it's, it behaves I'm, like a, It behaves like the spin, but uh, when we study this, it will be uh, a trivial. It will be a trivial I number see. one. That, that, that's all, that's more like a convention in the study of the CFT. I see, okay. Okay. Okay, I unmuted this one. So let's thank no. the speaker. <laughs> and we continue with the next the speaker, Ed. Uh, hey, can you share your- a nice talk. Good summary. Yeah, yeah. Good summary. Maybe it's a little too technical. So right. can you share your screen, Ed? Yep, let me get onto that now. Yeah. Nice. Okay. And you can see that still, right? 
Yes, everything all right. So for the next speaker, we have Edward Hairs from City University of London, and he will okay, tell us about machine learning statistics. Yes, please. Okay, lovely. Thanks for the introduction, Ali. Uh, yeah, so I'm Ed, I'm at City, and I'm going to talk about this paper on machine learning statistics, uh, more specifically, it's machine learning Hilbert series. And it's with my fantastic collaborators who are listed there at the bottom, two of whom are giving their own talks in this uh, session as well. So the brief overview of what I'll be going on today, since we're tight for time, I'm going to stick to a very simple presentation structure. I'm just going to have three slides, the first of which will talk about the machine learning architectures that we used in this project. The second is going to talk about the data, what we actually machine learned and how we formatted that for inputs and outputs. And then final slide is just going to talk about the results we got from that. So to get going with that first of three slides, um, what architectures were we using for this machine learning? Um, well, we've structured the problems that we looked at as supervised problems, which are possibly the most standard um, or commonly used style of machine learning problem. And in that, we also used a very standard structure. We used feed forward neural networks with uniform layer sizes and ReLU activation. So in many senses, we used the, the most standard or simple machine learning architecture. And that's kind of what also makes the results impressive is that we, with such simple structure, we can get some good results still. Um, on top of that, for, for those who come with machine learning, we used uh, the Adam optimizer and dependent on whether the problem was a regression problem, uh, producing a continuous output or a classification problem, some output from a finite set, we used log cost or cross entropy losses respectively, which were minimized. So after each of the investigation has been learned by the neural network, how do we measure how well it's learned? Well, in terms of classification, we used accuracy and Matthews correlation coefficient. And these just sort of look at the ratios of how often your validation or test set is being correctly predicted into the correct class. And the results, I'm only going to show the Matthews correlation coefficient. This tends to be a better measure. It handles problems with data bias a lot easier. And then in terms of the regression problems, I'm going to be using mean absolute error as the um, as the measure of performance as well. So for just if these are happen to be unfamiliar, uh, perfect learning is a mean MCC of one and perfect learning for regression is a mean absolute error of zero. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to add is that we use a five fold cross validation as well. So we, we effectively have five of the same network trained on different parts of the data and then we average those learning measures so we get a better idea of overall performance. Okay, so going on to the data, what we were actually machine learning. Uh, so we worked with Hilbert series or uh, generated Hilbert series. Um, what are these? You can think of it as some complex projective variety embedded in weighted projective space. And uh, when embedded in the weighted projective space, you can define a homogeneous coordinate ring, defining the coordinates on the projective space or on the projective variety. And this ring will admit a grading of some form. And then the Hilbert series is the function which tells you about the dimension of each of the graded piece of this coordinate rings grading. So you can see that in this first function, we get a, a series um, and or some sort of Taylor series, some infinite series structure, and each of the coefficients is the dimension of that graded piece. So the Hilbert series, when you, ha you can have it in this form, um, but you can also write it in two other equivalent forms in terms of taking the, the full series to the infinite limit. And in this form, it has an interesting structure. It, you can see these P's are the weights from the weight to projective space. So that's something we're going to be having a go at learning. We're going to be learning the, the vector of P's that, um, that the, relate to this Hilbert series in this projective space. And then in the other formats, there are other things that it admits. We can see this J factor. This is the Gronstein index. This can be thought physically as the factor you need to dilate the variety is equivalent to a diagram such that it becomes reflexive. And on top of that, we have the dimension of the space. And you can also see if the coordinate ring is Gorenstein or not, um, dependent on whether the numerator in this form is palindromic or not. So these are some of the things we're going to be machine learning. And just to give a bit of further physical motivation for Hilbert series, uh, they tend to be used physically in gauge theories because they enumerate the gauge invariant operators at different orders. They tell you information about the generators and the relations between those generators on your vacuum modular space in some theory. So just to reiterate before I move on to the results, what were the inputs and output structures? The inputs were vectors of coefficients from the Hilbert series. So we just say, for example, truncate this series to the first 100 orders 
and we have a vector of 101 entries and those become our vector inputs for the machine learning. And equivalently, we also do the same investigations with a vector of 10 inputs, which are deeper in the Hilbert series as well. Those are, so those are our inputs. What are our outputs? Well, depending on the investigation, we have either a vector of embedding weights. Uh, this is a particularly a regression problem that we were learning and measured with mean absolute error. We then have outputting Gorenstein index or dimension. And in each of these cases, these come from some finite set that we preset uh, for the learning. So these are both classification problems. And then finally, we're learning whether the um, Hilbert series predictive variety is Gorenstein or not, and also whether the projective variety is a complete intersection or not. So these both end up being uh, binary classification problems, whether it is Gorenstein or not, or it is complete intersection. So that's what the investigations were. This is the results for each of those investigations. So you see we now have uh, columns for each of those. Uh, here are the output ranges that the, um, the Hilbert series, what parameter values they could take. And here are the measures that we use. As I said before, we're using MCC uh, in this presentation of results. So to talk about these results, the mean absolute error for the learning the embedding weights got down to one. So that was certainly quite impressive for such a simple structure that it can, um, yeah, on average, I predict these embedding weights to a difference of one, considering they're over a range of 10 uh, for each of the three. That's quite impressive. And then beyond that, for the rest of the classification style problems, we managed to get MCCs over 90% in each case, uh, some, for example, is Gorenstein property was better at deeper, uh, using deep coefficients deeper in the Hilbert series, which was particularly interesting as well. And then finally, with this nice plot produced by Zhao Kang, um, this is a PCA, um, principal component analysis of the complete intersection investigation. So here, the vectors of the Hilbert series coefficients, the first hundred, um, are allocated a label with either complete intersection or not. And this gives them their color, red or blue. Uh, a PCA was then performed on this. And the 2D section here is taken with the PCA, which shows how nicely they separate out. So this is just sort of exemplify the kind of structure that these neural networks are taking advantage of in that in some uh, PCA space, they, these separate out quite nicely. So you can draw some surface and use that for your classification. Uh, that's everything I was going to talk about. Uh, thanks very much for listening. And I'm welcome, please welcome any questions. Okay, thanks, Ed, for the nice talk. We have more than two minutes for the question. If there is any question. So if there is no question, maybe I can ask about uh, some uh, using the machine learning to study the large charge limit of the Hilbert series. Any hint about that? We didn't actually consider that, but that would be something to, interesting to look at in the future. Okay. If not, uh, let's thank Ed again. Okay. Then we move on to the next talk. It's by Chente Ma. And he will tell us about the cubic action in double field theory. theory. Yes, please. Thank you. I think at the first I need, I hope to thank the, to give this opportunity to give this talk and also for the chair, Professor Zahadi's simple introduction for my talk. Uh, in today I will revisit the cubic action in the double theory. And in this talk, I will, I will generalize the study of the method is more to the Massive, massive more. And then, indeed, the massive more will give a massive gravity theory. And I will also show the difference between the double field theory and the string theory. In this work, I, I do the conversion with the Franco. And if you want to know more, de more details, please see the manuscript and the, the paper. And then the, the materiality is, is changing the moment, is changing momentum and the widening more. And then if you prompt, and now we will promote the momentum and one more to the target space and dual target space. And then we can, and then we can, we, the manifest is just to say that we can exchange the target space and the dual target space to see the man, manifest way of the T duality. And indeed, it's, it is the main idea, it's the main idea of the, uh, of the double field theory. And then it, it, this also gives us a, 
a, a new a, a simple geometry structure ODD. The double field theory double the complex torus. Uh, to animate a non physical state, we need a double field theory needs to introduce a constraint. And this is a, a momentum space version. Uh, an error is a, a, this constraint is derived from the level match condition. And an error is a number of level moving oscillators, and an is right one. And, and the PJ is a momentum operators, and the omega is winding operators. Then our prime is a, is, is a stand, is a usual string recovery. And we can rewrite the, the constraint to the position space that is it's like that. And uh, we can raise or lower the by double index by the ODD metric. And then we can also get the addition constraint by the integral by part of the integration term. So we can we can use these two constraints that we get to to include it in the commutative quadratic products. And when lambda finishes, the, the lambda finishes the constraint reduced to the strong constraint. Let me remind you the lambda is the lambda is 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 the lambda the version of lambda is here. Okay, for a cubic turn, we can also use a similar way to get a, the similar constraint uh, for a integral, by the integral by power of at least two turn, two integrations. And, the, the, and the each constraint also satisfies this constraint and the way we will get the, the constraint, this constraint, and then also, and also these two uh, uh, commutative products. And then this constraint is very interesting because it's unique, and this up to the cubic, cubic action. And the, because the product is commutative, therefore the gauge algebra is, is closed. And then the gauge transformation is here. The lambda does not will not appear in the uh, the, the, the lambda does not appear in the gauge transformation explicitly, hence the gauge transformation remains in the same form. Has many many results can be applied here, right to here. And so because the spectrum depends on the circle of the radius. So one cannot only keep the NL plus NRB in two with a consistent truncation. And when we keep this, this uh, NL plus NR, this, we will see the mass more and the mass is more. So it's interesting. Okay. Now they say that the quantity is a problem for the consistent truncation. Where the consistent truncation in string theory affect the, where, affect the, the, the uh, where we, where, where, whether we get a uh, concept consistent target space theory or get you invariant target space theory. And then the quantity order, we should, the answer should be no because it's just a free state. But for the quick order, we should, this is an integrating theory. So hence, people usually expect that we should have, we should start off inverted modes to get a uh, uh, same consistent or get you invariant theory. But however, we will, we will introduce a, uh, uh, we will, in the, we, we, we will find a gauge, we will obtain a gauge invariant theory without something over inverting the modes. For our choice, we have a three, for our case, we have a three choice. The first choice is a massive state with the graviton field and the diatom field, and uh, also the carbon number field. And then the, the main choice are the massive states. We just replace the carbon number field by the one form gauge field. And the number of physical degrees freedom is the same as the spin two fields poly, poly fields. And then, so hence we should expect that the target space should be a massive gravity theory. We will make a field corresponding for the mass state as in the following, and with the addition constraint on the gauge parameters. We will, okay, it, it is a, this constraint is similar, is similar to the massive, uh, mass, uh, massive gauge field theory. From, uh, for the massive gauge field, for, for the massive schedule field, say the number, the physical degree freedom is two. But if we introduce the massive turn, then, we, then the physical degree becomes three. So hence we need to introduce the constraint to the gauge parameters to increase the physical degree freedom. And then indeed, it's a unique, it's, a, it's, also, it's, only, it's also a unique way to get the gauge imbalance theory. If you do not impose the constraint, you cannot get the any get other gauge invariance theory. So it's a very unique. And then we, we will see that we will see that the, the lambda will become the massive parameter. And lambda proportional to NL is my NR over R prime. So hence the 
the difference of an error and an R can join the mass term. And also, it also implies that the, the mass gravity theory should, should live in the, uh, should be in the, in the double space. So it will go beyond string theory here. Let me say, let me now, let me say how to establish uh, constraint or, or see the solution. The simple case should be for D equal one, uh, which is a uh, double circles. And the, when we, uh, for, uh, for this, the constraint will give, uh, give the general, sol general solutions because it's D equal one, so it's easy to solve. And we can sub sub substitute the solution to the constraint, then it leads to the imaginary A or B. Hence, this, imply, this result implies that if you just consider D equal one, you cannot see maximum gravity because this solution cannot depend on momentum and the winding simultaneously. But however, this result is still, this solution is still interesting because it, it already showed, shows the difference between string theory and the double field theory. Let me remind that string theory for, for one, for one common space, we can see, we can see the safe dual radius spectrum, but now it finishes, it, now it, we cannot see it in double field theory. So hence we can see the difference here. So now let me say our look. We obtain the massive gravity theory from NL does not equal to NR. And then in our de nonlinear deformation, usually suffer from the issue of a Gaussian mode. And our theory respects string theory. Hence, it uh, should be self considered. And then the a new gravity mass term is proportional to NL so minus NR over our prime. Hence, one can apply our study to the cosmological observation, then it should constrain the stringent company of a prime. Oh, so we realize that gauge similar orbital could be older. Therefore, it's possible to extend our study to the generalized metric formula also or, or, or more complete theory. Because our study is just at the uh, it's just at the function field level. So it's hard, it's hard to see the geometry. So, so if we can do the extension, it's because it it's it's should be interesting because it's easier to explore the double geometry. Thank you for listening my to this talk. Thank you very much for the talk. Is there any question? If not, perhaps we can thanks again. Okay, so we move on to the next talk. It's by Subhajit Majumdar from City University. So can you share your screen, Suva? I'm doing that, uh, let's see. Okay, can you see the slides? Very good. So the next talk is by Subhajit Majumdar from City University of London, and he will tell us about the protected state uh, from EDS3 integrability. Yes, please. Hi, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to speak about some work that I did recently with my supervisor, Bogdan, and some other collaborators. So the problem we were looking at is how to compute protected states, which are very special states in the context of ADS CFT. Now, why do we bother about such questions? Because the, it's very difficult to pin down the ADS CFT duality. And one yeah. of the key things that one uses to uh, make this duality precise, or at least the dictionary precise, is to use these protected states, because these are states for which uh, physical properties are, these are states or quantities which remain invariant under the RG flow. Uh, and because of that, what happens is they are they don't get quantum corrections. And because of that, whatever uh, things, uh, if we compute it in the dual CFT or in the bulk string theory, uh, these states are guaranteed. If they are if these quantities are matching, then these states uh, are guaranteed to stay the same throughout the whole RG flow. And because of that, we are making sure that the duality we are conjecturing is exact. Now. In ADS5, S5, and ADS4 times CP3 background, such states are um, quite mundane in the sense that 
uh, you can label them. There is a very unique one that you can pinpoint to the, the so-called BMN vacuum. And uh, that is it. So given a set of global charges, uh, you can always pinpoint to a unique such state. But however, the story in ADS3 CFT2 is much richer, which is what we were probing. And uh, it's much more non-trivial. So uh, yeah, the spectrum is highly degenerate and this is very relevant even from the geometric sense. Uh, whatever results means the power of our results because we are using integrability uh, is that these results hold across a huge uh, 20 dimensional modelized space. And that is very nice because if previous works in this direction have been from either supergravity or CFT, and these are uh, only, uh, this hold only at very specific points or specific limits in the modelized space. However, our results hold because we are using integrability and as long as integrability holds true, our results are also correct. Okay, so let me briefly sh show the key results that we have in the paper. Uh, so we look at ADS3 times S3 times T4 string theory. And in this background, in the planar limit, integrability holds. And we recover using uh, the so-called algebraic with answers techniques, uh, the T4 Hodge diamond. And uh, we do the same for uh, orbi folds of uh, T4, where in which case we recover the K uh, orbi folds, specific orbi folds, which are uh, basically which resolve into K3s. And uh, in such cases, the we recover the seed theory, uh, uh, we recover the Hodge diamond of K3. Basically, H00 equals H22 equals H20 equals H02 equals 1, and H11 equals 20. So these are the Hodge numbers. And in this uh, T4 case, the diamond I have shown precisely gives back the T4 Hodge diamond. Okay, so what's the technique? These were the results. Now, for uh, in integrability, we use the so-called algebraic with Hansard's technique where we first start with the symmetry algebra of the problem, which is uh, in, uh, in our case is a PSU one slash one square centrally extended. Uh, and also there is another one, which is PAC one slash one to the power four centrally extended. So what are these algebras? This look fancy, but it basically comprises of a bunch of supercharges, QL, QR, SL, SR. And these are grading, uh, if these are fermionic generators and a, a bunch of bosonic ones, which are these Hamiltonians, HL, HR, and central charges, C and C bar. Okay, so this is our symmetry algebra. And we want to find S matrices slash R matrices, uh, which basically are uh, matrices which contain the information of scattering of the uh, fundament of representations of the symmetry algebra. In our case, the pertinent one is RLL here written here. So it's a six vertex form. So that means uh, out of the 16 entries of the uh, four by four matrix, only six are non-zero. And these uh, entries that I have written uh, are functions of so-called Zhukovsky variables, which are functions of the momentum levels P and Q that I have here. Okay, and the full R matrix for our problem is turns out to be a tensor product of this RLL and also a similar matrix RL tilde L tilde. And once you do that, you get a 16 by 16 R matrix. Okay, so this is the central object to construct our states, which will turn out to be the protected ones. Now, with this R matrix, what we can build is so-called monodromy matrix curly M and transfer matrix curly P. And these two objects have entries, uh, means we can re rewrite them as operator valued matrices, two by two matrices. And once we do that, these are the uh, technical details, but the main point I want to uh, take out from here is that these entries can be used to build the eigenstates of the transfer matrix T and hence of the Hamiltonian for which we are solving the eigenstate problem. Okay, so uh, these are the eigenstates and provided, so you see there are arguments inside here. These arguments actually have to satisfy certain algebraic relations for this in full state to be an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. These are so-called Bethe equations, which I have written down here. They look nasty, but 
the very interesting thing is this whole process simplifies drastically when you take zero momentum limit, which is the specific case where the corresponding states are protected. So we do that and we finally end up with eigenstates of this type n not n1 n3 these three levels actually can be translated to global charges or carried by these states and that makes the connection with the cft points or the subra points where these protected states were earlier computed in previous literature so doing this process we end up with this t4 hodge diamond which i briefly showed previously and the there are additional indices on top which are uh, showing what representations these states carry under an additional SU2 circle, which I didn't mention because it basically goes, means this SU2 circle just carries forward the charges with respect to this. Uh, it's not really very important for the integrability purpose. Okay, so these states match the Hodge diamond for the CT4 theory, which is what we expected because we are doing just the same ADST ST4 from the integrability perspective rather than the CFT perspective, which people have previously done, and this should be consistent. And also our results, similar things can be, uh, this integrability setup can be extended to Orbi folds. And once one does that, one gets uh, similar Hodge diamonds for K3. Uh, and that's it. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your nice talk. And you have two minutes for questions. Any question? Okay, if not, let's, uh, thanks. Suva. Thanks a lot. I stop the share. Yeah. Okay. Maybe we can take one minute for break. And yeah, thanks. Okay, perhaps we can resume the Gong Show. And for the next talk, we have Kaiwan Sun, okay, from Kyoth, and he will talk about the structure of the K to regulate uh, blow up equations. Yes, please. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the, this good opportunity to present my recent work. This is uh, based on joint work with Kim Young Lee in class. So the subject is uh, blow up equations, which we already heard last week in Song Su Kim's talk. If you are interested, uh, more details is, uh, uh, is in his talk. So uh, let's uh, repeat uh, what is blow up equations. In a word, blow up equations are the functional equations of Nicarasso Partition function. So at first, uh, this was uh, introduced uh, by two mathematicians, Nakajima and Yoshoka in 2003 to prove the famous uh, Nikrasov conjecture. Uh, later, soon it was uh, generalized uh, to uh, many situations such as uh, 5D and equals one theory in various uh, gauge group and uh, flavor group, and also generalized uh, to arbitrary a refined topological string theory on local color bell threefolds, and uh, was also recently generalized to all 61,0 and 2,0 SFTs, and also 5D n equals one star theory. So uh, the interest uh, of uh, my current talk is the uh, 5D blob equations, in other words, the K theoretical blob equations. So you can see that uh, this is a general formula for 
uh, case theoretical graph equations. Here, z is a partition function of uh, an arbitrary 5D n equals one supersymmetric gauge theory. Epsilon one, epsilon two are the two Nikrasov's deformation parameter. And A is the gauge parameter, also uh, meaning the coolant parameter. And uh, MF is the flavor parameter. And the Q is the 5D instant counting parameter. And the bluff equations uh, on the left hand side, uh, this count as a partition function on the C2 with one point uh, blown up. And you can see that uh, this is a, a infinite summation of a bad product. This infinite summation is uh, taking in the uh, co-weight lattice of the gauge group. And uh, the non-trivial thing of Blob equation is that uh, for special choice of uh, uh, this K lambda F and uh, shift lambda Q. So this uh, uh, infinite uh, summation goes back to the partition function itself or equal to zero. So when it goes to itself, we call it a unity blob equations and go to zero, we call it a vanishing blob equations. This is the functional equations of Nikrasov partition function. And uh, this triple uh, is called the R fields in the, top, uh, in the Calabial context. And uh, the shifts of the gauge parameters is taking value in this uh, center of the uh, gauge group. For example, uh, we, we can have this uh, table for arbitrary A, B, C, D, F, G uh, gauge group. You can see there are this NC number of uh, choices of the gauge flux uh, where the infinite summation uh, took over. And uh, so what is the structure of uh, case relative block equations? So there are already some uh, uh, many works on this uh, Blob equation to 5D n equals one series. So many for some special cases, they found uh, some uh, very special 5D blob equations. So here we want to ask uh, what are all blob equations for, uh, for 5D n equals one series. And uh, our strategy or our, our, our conjecture is that uh, we conjecture that uh, all the all blob equations for one 5D n plus one series can be obtained from the RG flow of all 5D KK series. Here, KK theory means Kaluza Klein theory compactified from 60 1,0 or 2,0 SFTs. And the RG flow means we uh, decouple the hypermultiplets or the matter content in 5D gauge series. So uh, this is the main conjecture of our uh, paper and uh, here I just uh, uh, hope to show you one simple example which everyone is familiar uh, familiar with. So this is the five D S P one with uh, several fundamentals. So or S U two if you will. So we know that in five D S U two theory can carry at most eight fundamentals. So this uh, is a uh, 5D compactification of the 60 Eastern theory, which is a 1,0 at the 60 SFT. And uh, we found that uh, from uh, the elliptic blob equations of Eastern series, we can get uh, this number of uh, uh, one vanishing blob equations and uh, 20, uh, 240 unity blob equations. And uh, by decoupling all the matters all the eight fundamentals one by one, we can find all the uh, 5D block equations for the five uh, SU2 with uh, NF number of uh, fundamentals. For example, uh, this is uh, the number of unity block equations. And uh, so we want to study one interesting thing about uh, 5D influence with symmetric gauge theory is the flavor enhancement when flowing to the 5D SFD point. So uh, in, which, uh, in which case uh, the flavor group got enhanced in the 5D SFD point. And uh, there is a crucial uh, concept called the environment coolant parameters, which means uh, the Nikrasov partition function will be environment under the redefined coolant parameter. 
And uh, what we found here is a very non-trivial phenomenon that uh, all the R fields of uh, 5D equals one uh, gauge theory will form the where orbit of the enhanced global symmetry uh, when flowing to the 5D SFT point. And this is actually a very good criteria that uh, we did find all the 5D blob equations. For example, here I show you one very simple example that is uh, the rank one RG flow. We flowing from the SP1 with eight flavor, which is Eastern to to all uh, to the cases with less and less flavor, and this is uh, well known in the old work of Severg and Morrison. So uh, in this uh, work, they already found the definition of environmental cooling parameters for all these series, and after converting to the environmental cooling parameters, we found that uh, all the R fields indeed can be written as the where orbits or, or, uh, or representations of the enhanced flavor group. For example, uh, here there is all the R fields of the uh, 5D with eight flavor and seven flavor, six flavor, five flavor, uh, four flavor. And uh, you can see that uh, this is uh, how the R fields of the blob equations degenerate so in the end, this is the uh, 5D pure SU2 uh, theory. So another interesting phenomenon is the 5D duality. So they can be regarded as the different uh, mass deformations of the same 5D SFT. And uh, in the geometry viewpoint, uh, this is can be regarded as a fiber-based duality inside the uh, Hisbrook surface. Or in some cases, the can also be seen from the brain wax by rotating the brain web or resolving O7 minus brains. And what we found that uh, for blow up equations, uh, very non trivially, that uh, this 5D dualities are all respected. In the case that uh, we found the full set of the 5D blow up equations. Notice that uh, this is a very non-trivial phenomenon because uh, 5D duality is uh, often uh, connected to, connect, uh, to uh, 5D series with completely different uh, get group and the flavor group. And so this uh, R fields is a uh, one-to-one map to each other is a very non-trivial phenomenon and uh, even can help us to find and uh, and or rule out the 5D dualities. So in, in summary, uh, in summary, we have uh, uh, three uh, points. So first, we can find uh, the full set of K theoretical block equations for 5D gauge theory from 6D and uh, the elliptic block equations. Third, uh, second is the uh, flavor enhancement. We found that uh, when 5D n equals one gate theory is flowing to uh, flow to the 5D SFT point, all the R fields of the block equations form the with the where orbits of the enhanced flavor symmetry. And third, we found the 5D dualities are very non-trivially uh, reflected in the K theoretical block equations. Uh, thanks. Thank you very much for the talk. Perhaps we have uh, we have time for a short question from the audience. If not, let's thank again. So, shall I share my screen? Yes, please, Waldo. Right. You see? Yeah, that's good. Okay. So, for the next talk, we have Waldo Tikov, uh, and he will talk about the octagon Heimer model. Yes, please.
All right. Um, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for such a beautiful conference and also for giving me the opportunity to give a short talk today. So I'm going to show you how one can use some combinatorial tools to construct a Daimler model satisfying lots of constraints coming from physics. And this talk is based on four papers recently written by the six friendly faces on the left and myself. So let's start with the definition of brain tailing. So a brain tailing is a bicolored graph embedding in a topological torus such that each face is simply connected. So of course, not all brain tailings are interesting, uh, but the so-called consistent ones surely are. In what follows, all the Emir models are assumed to be consistent. One possible definition of consistency is in terms of zigzag paths. Zigzag paths are oriented paths turning maximally right at each black vertices and maximally left at each white vertices. Here's the statement of consistency in terms of zigzag path, but we won't need the details of that. We can also, and we will, represent zigzag path as trends crossing edges at their middle. Any zigzag path, since it's non-trivial topologically by consistency, winds around the torus. For example, the red zigzag path here has winding 1-1. One, one. So brain tailing encode n equals 1 equals 4 quiver gauge theories, and each one corresponds to an affine Tori Calabria threefold enhanced to a lattice polygon up to SL2 Z. Going from the dimer to the polygon is called the forward algorithm, and it's not injective in general. Constructing a dimer from a polygon is called the inverse algorithm, and uh, correspondingly, it's one to many in general. Note that the zigzag path on the left are in one to one correspondence with vectors normals to the sides of the polygon. The winding of the former is the pair of coordinates of the latter. Daimler models are also related to cluster algebras and varieties. They can, for example, be used to parameterize double Brier cells, and they have uh, many more applications. So a recipe for the inverse algorithm is provided by triple point diagrams introduced by Thurston in 2004. One starts with a topological disk on the boundary of which there are n in and n out points placed in an alternating way. So here n equals four and um, together with a pairing between in and out points, which is displayed here in colors. One of Thurston's results is that every such pairing can be realized by a triple point diagram defined exactly as the name suggests. One can then slightly deform the triple point diagram in such a way that each crossing is replaced by a small triangle uh, with, whose sides are oriented counterclockwise. At that point, there are three types of faces. See the black ones, uh, they have their sides oriented counterclockwise, the white ones have their sides oriented clockwise, and the gray one on the boundary of which the, the orientation alternates. One obtains a bicolored graph on the disk from that by putting a black vertex at each black face, a white vertex at each white face, and edges according to adjacency. Let's now apply these ideas to um, the inverse algorithm. So let's start with this polygon, which defines a singular affine Tori Calabi of threefold known as DP1. So first, one places zigzag path on the torus as oriented straight lines with the good slope so that they have the winding prescribed by the polygon. And such that as for Thurston's triple point diagrams, the insertions of in and out points on the boundary of the fundamental cell alternate. The fundamental cell is topologically a disk. Hence, one can build a bicolored graph as before by drawing a triple point diagram realizing the data on the boundary, then deforming it, and so on and so forth. We obtain a consistent Daimler model in which uh, we can construct the two valent nodes, redrawing it nicely, one obtains this brain tailing, which is um, famous and indeed corresponds to DP1. So let me now briefly explain some physical motivations for our work. Um, dynamical supersymmetry breaking models are special quantum field theories of phenomenological and theoretical interest. For many reasons, for example, to see whether known DSB theories are compatible with quantum gravity, it's interesting to wonder if it's possible at all to realize them in brain tellings. Because of the tools at our disposal, we restricted our analysis to two theories, namely the SU5 and the 3 2 models, whose structure is encoded in these two quivers. In what follows, we will restrict to the SU5 model only. So in 2007, two examples of brain tailings hosting the SU5 model were given, corresponding respectively to these two lattice polygons. However, 
It's then been shown that the SUSY breaking vacuum predicted by the SU5 model is destabilized in UV completions in these brain tailings, essentially because the polygons are not strictly convex. We then showed that all brain tailings setups hosting the SU5 model, but one must necessarily be in diamond models corresponding to non strictly convex polygons. The one I'm speaking of is the hexagonal cluster displayed on the right. Half of it is shaded because it's not this cluster per se, but rather it's orientifold and coded as a reflection with respect to a line which makes the SU5 model appear, or rather two decoupled copies of the SU5 model. Hence the question of whether there exists a brain tiling with the good properties containing this hexagonal cluster. So wrapping up, we wish to construct a Daimler model corresponding to a strictly convex polygon, symmetric with respect to a vertical line and containing the hexagonal cluster of our interest. There are other constraints. I don't really have the time to review in details, but to give one example, the zigzag path um, going around the six valent nodes uh, must have winding summing to zero. With a view towards implementing our inverse algorithm cookbook, let's draw all the zigzag path corresponding to the hexagonal cluster and um, just keep the in and out insertions on the boundary so that we know that with such in and out pairing, we can reconstruct the hexagonal cluster. In order to embed this cluster into a dimer model, it turns out that we need at least eight zigzag path. The octagon is a reasonable choice for its symmetry with respect to an axis, and hence it's likely that we will be able to construct a brain tailing with a similar symmetry. We place the eight zigzag path as straight line on the fundamental cell in a symmetric way. Because of that, they are crossing on the boundary. So let's deform it slightly um, so that alternation of in and out points on the boundary holds. Let us keep only the insertion points and add the ellipse of before with the insertion points of the hexagonal cluster. Now, the reddish uh, left part of the fundamental cell is a topological disk satisfying Thurston's conditions just as the bluish right parts. Hence, we can construct a triple point diagram on the left and a triple point diagram on the right as symmetrically as possible. Now the rest of the inverse algorithm is straightforward, deform and add uh, black and white vertices, then edges according to adjacency. It yields a bicolor graph on a torus with one hole. We can now fill the hole with our hexagonal cluster and then contract the two valent vertices. Massaging a bit and undeforming the fundamental cell, we finally obtain the hexagonal diamond model under a fancy guise. To conclude, I just presented you how to construct complicated diamond models with constraints using the triple point diagrams technology. And thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for the nice talk. We have a lot of time for question. Is there any question? Maybe I can ask the first question. You talk about the construction for this example. Can you generalize it to a generic diamond model? Yeah, of course. So um, I presented the example for DP1 to show the general method. Um, but what's really interesting here is that we can also um, use the method to construct diamond models with constraints, for example, with a symmetry constraints. Uh, with the method that uh, we can do it in general. But the, the bigger the, the polygon and the harder it gets. Okay, good. Any other questions? And we we'll ask a quick question as well. Hey Valda, very nice talk. Um, so this method where you do this deformation um, such that you then can produce the uh, um, the brain tiling from the, or the diamond model from the um, toy diagram. So this this makes the inverse algorithm one-to-one -one when if you follow this algorithm, is that right? Uh, it's not one to one because you have choices to make uh, when you place uh, when you place zigzag path, uh, so that alternation of in and out points on the boundary holds, and even with a um, a disk with in and out points and a pairing between them, in general there are many minimal uh, triple point diagrams that you can draw, and um, there is an equivalent. I mean, uh, it's something equivalent to cyber duality. It's called the two two moves or spider moves that. Okay. Um, I mean, are elementary steps that allow you to go from one triple points diagram to another. So in general, it's not one-to-one, -one, it's more like one-to-many starting from the polygon. Okay, nice.
Right. So yeah, I mean, uh, to get to the end result, uh, we yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, we we had some constraints that we wanted to be satisfied. So nice. and the choices. Okay. Is there any other question? If not, let's thank Waldo again. Thank you. Thank you. And I guess the last talk of the Gong Show is by Zheng Gao Zhong from Imperial. Can you share your screen, please? Ah, hello. Hey. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. So we have Zheng Gao Zhong. And he will tell us about magnetic quivers of 4D and 5D gauge theories. Yes, please. Um, thank you for having me in this amazing symposium. So today I'll be talking about magnetic quivers of 4D and 5D gauge theories. So this is seen as a continuation of Amihai's talk from last Monday, where now we look at some specific examples of magnetic quivers. And this is based on several of our previous works in collaboration with Antoine Boget, Simone Giacomelli, Julius Griminger, Anka Hanani, Rudolf Kelbex, Marcus Sperling, and Gabby Zafrir. So we will be focusing on gauge theories with eight supercharges, and in particular, 5D n equals one and 4D n equals two theories. Now these theories, they have a very rich vacuum structure and this makes it worthwhile to study the moduli space of vacua called the Higgs branch. But the Higgs branch is not always easy to study directly. For example, 5D theories, the UV fixed point, or 4D CFTs. So here we take a more indirect approach using the magnetic quiver. So what is the magnetic quiver? Well, for this Gong Show, I will use a more restricted definition as follows. So a magnetic quiver is a 3D n equals four gauge theory whose Coulomb branch is the same as the Higgs branch of the 5D or 4D theory you're trying to study. In other words, rather than studying the Higgs branch of the 5D or 4D theories directly, I will first find the corresponding magnetic quiver and then study its Coulomb branch instead, because by definition, this is the same as the Higgs branch of the original theory. Okay, so why do I go through this little detour in finding this magnetic quiver? Well, in the last nine or 10 years, there have been many new tools developed specifically to understand the Coulomb branch of 3D n equals four gauge theories. And now we're able to use all of these tools in order to study the Coulomb branch of a magnetic quiver, and hence indirectly study the Higgs branch of the 5D or 4D theory. Okay, so here, uh, just a quick disclaimer. This is a bit of a more restricted definition. And in reality, the Higgs branch can be also for 6D theories or 3D theories, and it can correspond to more than just a single magnetic quiver. But just to keep things simple, today, We'll only be looking at the Higgs branch of 5D and 4D gauge theories, which corresponds to a single magnetic quiver. Just to keep things simple. Okay, so here is an example. We first look at 5D n equals one gauge theories. And we'll be looking at an SU3 gauge theory with six flavors. So for this gauge theory, how do we find the magnetic quiver? Well, the most natural way to do so is using a brain setup. So on the left-hand side, we have the brain setup. We have lines, which represents the five brains, and circles, which represents seven brains. So the seven brains, they extend into your computer screen, and the five brains are suspended between them and move along the seven brains. The positions of the five brains along the seven brains parameterizes the Higgs branch of our theory. And this is why this brain setup here tells us about the Higgs branch. Now, from this brain setup, we can use the algorithm by Cabrera, Hanani, and Yagi, and we read off the corresponding magnetic quiver. For example, here we see three stacks of blue D5 brains. This will correspond to a U3 gauge group. We have a single NS5 brain, 
This will correspond to a U1 gauge loop, etc. Okay, so here we are. We have the magnetic quiver, and indeed, the Coulomb branch of this magnetic quiver is the same as the Higgs branch of an SU3 gauge theory with six flavors. Well, to be more precise, when the gauge coupling is finite, because the Higgs branch, it will change depending on your gauge coupling. So we can see this also from the brain setup. Notice here the two vertical lines, which are your NS5 brains. The distance between them is given by the inverse of the gauge coupling squared. So if the spacing is finite, it means the gauge coupling here is finite. But I can send the gauge coupling to infinity. So then one over G squared becomes zero and the two NS5 brains come together. So now I have a brain setup that describes the Higgs branch of an SU3 with six flavors as infinite gauge coupling or as the UV fixed point. So here at the infinite coupling limit, there are now new master states that comes in and the Higgs branch is enhanced. So if the Higgs branch changes, then the magnetic quiver has to change as well. So from this new brain setup, I will read off the corresponding magnetic quiver on the right-hand side. And indeed, the Coulomb branch of this quiver is the same as the Higgs branch of an SU3 gauge theory with six flavors at the infinite coupling. So this is nice. Now we have magnetic quivers of 5D theories, both as a finite and infinite gauge coupling. But we can do more. We can take this 5D n equals one theory at infinite coupling, we compactify it on a circle with a Z2 twist. And this is known to produce a 4D n equals two superconformal field theory with a C3A1 global symmetry. But we can also repeat this directly on the magnetic quiver. We first observe a Z2 symmetry of the quiver, and then we fold it along the symmetry. The resulting folded magnetic quiver, which has some non-simply laced edges, it's indeed the Coulomb branch of this folded magnetic quiver is the same as the Higgs branch of this 4D n equals two theory. So we start with a magnetic quiver of a 5D theory, and through this folding, we obtain a magnetic quiver of a 4D theory. So this is quite a nice little trick. And by repeating this procedure, it allows us to find all the magnetic quivers that corresponds to the classification of rank one 4D n equals two SCFTs. All right, so finally, notice that all the magnetic quiver here are only made up of unitary gauge groups. So these guys and the guys above, I only look at unitary gauge groups so far, but magnetic quivers are not limited to unitary gauge groups. We can have other types of gauge groups as well. So now let's look at the 5D n equals one theory of SU2 with seven flavors at infinite coupling limit. So as usual, I bring set up. But now I also have oriented for planes in between, denoted by the different red lines. So here we have oriented for five planes. And because of the oriented for five planes, when I read off the magnetic quiver, it will now include gauge groups that are symplectic and special orthogonal as well. So we now have an orthosymplectic magnetic quiver. And indeed, this orthosymplectic magnetic quiver, the Coulomb branch of this theory, describes the Higgs branch of an SU2 gauge theory with seven flavors at the infinite coupling. Very good. And now we can proceed as before. We take this magnetic quiver. We see there is a Z2 symmetry down the middle. And I can fold this magnetic quiver along the symmetry again, giving me a folded orthosymplectic quiver. And in this case, it is a magnetic quiver of a 4D n equals two gauge theory. So I'm just taking all the different steps that we looked at with unitary magnetic quivers. And now we can repeat them also for orthosymplectic magnetic quivers. All right, so now that I have the magnetic quivers, what can I do with them? Well, there's a lot of fun things we can do. For example, if I wish to study a spectrum of operators in the Higgs branch of the 5D n equals one or 4D n equals two theories, no problem. We have the magnetic quiver. I know how to compute the Coulomb branch Hilbert series of this magnetic quiver using the multiple formula. And this will be equivalent to the Higgs branch Hilbert series of the 5D or 4D theories. So this we can now do easily. Or 
if you want to understand the phase diagram or Hasse diagram of the Higgs branch of the 5D or 4D theories, no problem. We have the magnetic quivers, and we can use this operation called quiver subtraction, which precisely gives us the Hasse diagram of the moduli space. So here we have the Higgs branch Hasse diagram or phase diagram of the 4DN equals 2 SCFTs, which we looked at. So just to summarize, now we have, uh, I showed you how we can obtain magnetic quivers, both that are made of unitary gauge groups or orthosyntactic gauge groups. And it also shows that once we have the magnetic quivers, we can really learn a lot of information from it, such as computing the Hilbert series or drawing the Hasse diagrams. Thank you. Thank you very much for your nice talk. And any question? If not, maybe I can ask a question. So in the beginning, you have discussed some limit of the coupling. Uh, you have the going to infinity. What about the case you sent G to zero? Ah, yes. So when we look at the magnetic quiver here, it really does not, at least in this case, it doesn't really differentiate between the gauge coupling sending to zero or the gauge coupling to finite. So sometimes the difference between a finite gauge coupling and zero gauge coupling is really a discrete element. And um, so far, I don't really think we can see that in the magnetic quiver. So we have really just two limits. One is when the gauge coupling is at infinity, and one is when it's zero or finite, at least from the magnetic quiver point of view. Thanks. Any question? If not, let's uh, thank again, Zheng Gao. Thank you. So with this, Talk, we end the gong show. And is there any question or comment in general from any of the audience, any of the talk? If not, then we formally end the gong show.